Lesson 2 The Family Sabbath Afternoon October 3 Christ placed such a high estimate upon your children that He gave His life for them. Treat them as the purchase of His blood. Patiently and firmly train them for Him. Discipline with love and forbearance. As you do this, they will become a crown of rejoicing to you and will shine as lights in the world. The Adventist Home, page 279. Young children love companionship and can seldom enjoy themselves alone. They yearn for sympathy and tenderness. That which they enjoy they think will please mother also, and it is natural for them to go to her with their little joys and sorrows. The mother should not wound their sensitive hearts by treating with indifference matters that, though trifling to her, are of great importance to them. Her sympathy and approval are precious. An approving glance, a word of encouragement or commendation, will be like sunshine in their hearts, often making the whole day happy. Parents should encourage their children to confide in them and unburden to them their heart griefs, their little daily annoyances and trials. Kindly instruct them and bind them to your hearts. It is a critical time for children. Influences will be thrown around them to wean them from you, which you must counteract. Teach them to make you their confidant. Let them whisper in your ear their trials and joys. The Adventist Home Pages 190 and 191. Love proceeds from God. It is a plant of heavenly growth, and it cannot live and flourish in the natural heart. Where it exists, there is truth and life and power, but it cannot live without action, and whenever it is exercised, it increases and extends. It will not observe little mistakes and be quick to mark little errors. It will prevail when argument, when any amount of words will prove vain and useless. The very best way to reform the character and regulate the conduct of your family is through the principle of love. It is indeed a power and will accomplish that which neither money nor might ever can. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, page 256 While we are not to indulge blind affection, neither are we to manifest undue severity. Children cannot be brought to the Lord by force. They can be led, but not driven. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, Christ declares. He did not say, My sheep hear my voice, and are forced into the path of obedience. In the government of children, love must be shown. Never should parents cause their children pain by harshness or unreasonable exactions. Harshness drives souls into Satan's net. The combined influence of authority and love will make it possible to hold firmly and kindly the reins of family government. An eye single to the glory of God and to what our children owe Him will keep us from looseness and from sanctioning evil. The Adventist Home, pages 307 and 308. Sunday October 4. The First Family. I speak to fathers and mothers. You can be educators in your home churches. You can be spiritual missionary agencies. Let fathers and mothers feel the need of being home missionaries, the need of keeping the home atmosphere free from the influence of unkind and hasty speech, and the home school a place where angels of God can come in and bless and give success to the efforts put forth. Consider the family institution a training school, preparatory for the performance of religious duties, your children are to act a part in church capacity, and every power of the mind, every physical capacity is to be kept strong and active for the service of Christ. They are to be taught to love truth because it is truth. They are to be sanctified through the truth that they may stand in the grand review that shall take place ere long to determine the fitness of each to enter the higher school and become a member of the royal family, a child of the heavenly king. Child Guidance, pages 481 and 482.
Family religion consists in bringing up the children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Everyone in the family is to be nourished by the lessons of Christ, and the interest of each soul is to be strictly guarded in order that Satan shall not deceive and allure away from Christ. This is the standard every family should aim to reach, and they should determine not to fail or to be discouraged. When parents are diligent and vigilant in their instruction and train their children with an eye single to the glory of God, they cooperate with God, and God cooperates with them in the saving of the souls of the children for whom Christ has died. Religious instruction means much more than ordinary instruction. It means that you are to pray with your children, teaching them how to approach Jesus and tell Him all their wants. It means that you are to show in your life that Jesus is everything to you and that His love makes you patient, kind, forbearing, and yet firm in commanding your children after you, as did Abraham. The Adventist Home, page 317 Hearts that are filled with the love of Christ can never get very far apart. Religion is love, and a Christian home is one where love reigns and finds expression in words and acts of thoughtful kindness and gentle courtesy. Religion is needed in the home. Only where Christ reigns can there be deep, true, unselfish love. Then soul will be knit with soul, and the two lives will blend in harmony. Angels of God will be guests in the home. Upward to God will the thoughts be directed. To Him will the heart's devotion ascend. In every family where Christ abides, a tender interest and love will be manifested for one another, a love that is deep and abiding. The Adventist Home, page 94. Monday, October 5. The Childhood of Jesus. The importance and the opportunities of the home life are illustrated in the life of Jesus. He who came from heaven to be our example and teacher spent 30 years as a member of the household at Nazareth. Concerning these years, the Bible record is very brief. No mighty miracles attracted the attention of the multitude. No eager throngs followed his steps or listened to his words. Yet during all these years, he was fulfilling his divine mission. He lived as one of us, sharing the home life, submitting to its discipline, performing its duties, bearing its burdens. In the sheltering care of a humble home, participating in the experiences of our common lot, he increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Luke chapter 2, verse 52. The Ministry of Healing, page 349. It was natural for the parents of Jesus to look upon him as their own child. He was daily with them. His life, in many respects, was like that of other children, and it was difficult for them to realize that he was the Son of God. They were in danger of failing to appreciate the blessing granted them in the presence of the world's Redeemer. The grief of their separation from him and the gentle reproof which his words conveyed were designed to impress them with the sacredness of their trust. In the answer to his mother, Jesus showed for the first time that he understood his relation to God. Before his birth, the angel had said to Mary, He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. Luke chapter 1 verses 32 and 33. These words Mary had pondered in her heart, yet while she believed that her child was to be Israel's Messiah, she did not comprehend his mission. Now she did not understand his words, but she knew that he had disclaimed kinship to Joseph and had declared his sonship to God. The Desire of Ages, pages 81 and 82. The life of Christ was marked with respect and love for his mother. Mary believed in her heart that the holy child born of her was the long-promised Messiah, yet she dared not express her faith. Throughout his life on earth, she was a partaker in his sufferings. She witnessed with sorrow the trials brought upon him in his childhood and youth. 
By her vindication of what she knew to be right in his conduct, she herself was brought into trying positions. She looked upon the associations of the home and the mother's tender watch care over her children as of vital importance in the formation of character. The Desire of Ages, page 90. Tuesday, October 6. Communication. The teacher's obligations are weighty and sacred, but no part of the work is more important than to look after the youth with tender, loving solicitude that they may feel that we have a friend in them. Once gain their confidence and you can lead them, control them, and train them easily. The holy motives of our Christian principles must be brought into our life. The salvation of our pupils is the highest interest entrusted to the God-fearing teacher. He is Christ's worker, and his special and determined effort should be to save souls from perdition and win them to Jesus Christ. If the heart is glowing with the love of God, there will be pure affection which is essential. Prayers will be fervent, and faithful warnings will be given. Neglect these, and the souls under your charge are endangered. Better spend less time in long speeches or in absorbing study and attend to these neglected duties. Fundamentals of Christian Education, pages 116 and 117. The Christian will shine as a light amid the moral darkness of the world. He will be tender of heart and considerate of the feelings of others. The Word of God instructs us to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves and it is the duty of every Christian to bring himself under discipline to the rules of the Bible, that he may be a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. The work coming from the hands of those who do this will be as lasting as eternity. It will not be mingled with a shred of selfishness, and it will not be loose, careless work. Tender affections should ever be cherished between husband and wife, parents and children, brothers and sisters. Every hasty word should be checked, and there should not be even the appearance of the lack of love one for another. It is the duty of everyone in the family to be pleasant, to speak kindly. Cultivate tenderness, affection, and love that have expression in little courtesies, in speech, in thoughtful attentions. Sons and Daughters of God, page 83. Speech is one of the great gifts of God. It is the means by which the thoughts of the heart are communicated. It is with the tongue that we offer prayer and praise to God. With the tongue, we convince and persuade. With the tongue, we comfort and bless, soothing the bruised, wounded soul. With the tongue, we may make known the wonders of the grace of God. Guard well the talent of speech, for it is a mighty power for evil as well as for good. You cannot be too careful of what you say, for the words you utter show what power is controlling the heart. If Christ rules there, your words will reveal the beauty, purity, and fragrance of a character molded and fashioned by His will. Only through Christ can we gain the victory over the desire to speak hasty, unchristlike words. When in his strength we refuse to give utterance to Satan's suggestions, the plant of bitterness in our hearts withers and dies. The Holy Spirit can make the tongue a savor of life unto life. God wants us to be a help and strength to one another. He wants us to speak words of hope and courage. In Heavenly Places, page 174. Wednesday October 7. The Role of Parents The father is the priest and the house band of the home. The mother is the teacher of the little ones from their babyhood and the queen of the household. Never is she to be slighted. Never are careless, indifferent words to be spoken to her before the children. She is their teacher. In thought and word and deed, the Father is to reveal the religion of Christ, that his children may see plainly that he has a knowledge of what it means to be a Christian. Reflecting Christ, page 178. 
Aaron was eminent for piety and usefulness, but he neglected to discipline his family. Rather than perform the task of requiring respect and reverence of his sons, he allowed them to follow their inclinations. He did not discipline them in self-denial, but yielded to their wishes. They were not disciplined to respect and reverence parental authority. The father was the proper ruler of his own family as long as he lived. His authority was not to cease even after his children were grown up and had families of their own. God himself was the monarch of the nation, and from the people he claimed obedience and honor. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, page 294 Even before the birth of the child, the preparation should begin that will enable it to fight successfully the battle against evil. Especially does responsibility rest upon the mother, she by whose lifeblood the child is nourished and its physical frame built up, imparts to it also mental and spiritual influences that tend to the shaping of mind and character. It was Jacobed, the Hebrew mother, who, strong in faith, was not afraid of the king's commandment, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 23, of whom was born Moses, the deliverer of Israel. It was Hannah, the woman of prayer and self-sacrifice and heavenly inspiration, who gave birth to Samuel, the heaven-instructed child, the incorruptible judge, the founder of Israel's sacred schools. It was Elizabeth, the kinswoman and kindred spirit of Mary of Nazareth, who was the mother of the Savior's herald. The Ministry of Healing, pages 371 and 372. It is the special work of fathers and mothers to teach their children with kindliness and affection. They are to show that as parents, they are the ones to hold the lines, to govern, and not to be governed by their children. They are to teach that obedience is required of them. The children need to be instructed, to be guided in safe paths, to be kept from vice, to be won by kindness, and be confirmed in well-doing. Fathers and mothers, you have a solemn work to do. The eternal salvation of your children depends upon your course of action. How will you successfully educate your children? Not by scolding, for it will do no good. Talk to your children as if you had confidence in their intelligence. Deal with them kindly, tenderly, lovingly. Tell them what God would have them do. Tell them that God would have them educated and trained to be laborers together with Him. When you act your part, you can trust the Lord to act His part. Child Guidance, page 33 Thursday, October 8 Lest ye forget The Bible gives explicit directions concerning the important work of educating children. The parents are themselves to be connected with God. They are to have His fear before them and to have a knowledge of His will. Then comes their work. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. Here the duties of parents are clearly set forth. The word of God is to be their daily monitor. It gives such instruction that parents need not err in regard to the education of their children, but it admits of no indifference or negligence. The law of God is to be kept before the minds of the children as the great moral standard. When they rise up and when they sit down, when they go out and when they come in, this law is to be taught them as the great rule of life, and its principles are to be interwoven with all their experience. They are to be taught to be honest, truthful, temperate, economical, and industrious, and to love God with the whole heart. This is bringing them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. This is setting their feet in the path of duty and safety. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, pages 328 and 329.
The nobler the aims, the higher the mental and spiritual endowments and the better developed the physical powers of the parents, the better will be the life equipment they give their children. In cultivating that which is best in themselves, parents are exerting an influence to mold society and to uplift future generations. Fathers and mothers need to understand their responsibility. The world is full of snares for the feet of the young. Multitudes are attracted by a life of selfish and sensual pleasure. They cannot discern the hidden dangers or the fearful ending of the path that seems to them the way of happiness. Through the indulgence of appetite and passion, their energies are wasted and millions are ruined for this world and for the world to come. Parents should remember that their children must encounter these temptations. The Ministry of Healing, page 371. Parents are the first teachers of their children, and by the lessons that they give, they, as well as their children, are being educated. Keep Christ before your children by singing songs to His glory, by seeking Him in prayer, and by reading from His Word, so that He will seem to them an ever-present guest. Then they will love Him and will be brought so closely into unison with Him that they will breathe out His Spirit. They will feel a new relationship to one another in Christ. In Heavenly Places, page 209. For further reading, Sons and Daughters of God, In the Study of Nature, page 135, and Education, Discipline, pages 287 to 297.